So today we want to speak to us about lessons from the life of Enoch. Lessons from the life of Enoch. I know many of us have heard about Enoch in the scripture. In Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Let's bring it up so we can all see it together. Hallelujah. The Bible says, And Enoch walked with God, and it was not for God took him. For God took him. And Enoch walked with God, and it was not for God took him. Now, this scripture, um, you know, even though it's just um, like one sentence or maybe one and a half sentence, it carries a lot. It carries a lot. And um, the first thing is that there was a man called Enoch. And the second thing, there was an action. There was an action from that man. And that action was the walking. And he walked with God. He walked with God. And the Bible says, and he was not. Sometimes when the scripture, especially King James, when you use the word and, that and, there's a possibility of, you know, some other things that are embedded before that and. If you look at Genesis 1 verse 1, the Bible says in the beginning was, in the beginning God created the heavens and the head. Verse 2 now says, and the earth was without form. Now, before the end, there was a beginning. There was a beginning. And before that end, there is a possibility of a lot of things that has happened. But what is more important now is that and. If you look at NIV, NIV says now, now the head was without form. The earth was without form. Now. So even though in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. But now, the earth was without form and void. Praise the Lord. Now, if you look that, at that, you know, um, you could call it colloquial. Colloquialism in English. Whereby you actually get to join words together to make um, um, a meaning. A different meaning from it. Now, if you look at, let's go back to that Genesis chapter 5 that we read. Genesis 5.24, about Enoch. So we said, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Now, this is NIV. Enoch walked faithfully with God. The, NIV now said, then he was no God what took him. Then he was no more because what? God took him. Praise the Lord. Now, a very typical example when God was teaching me about this story of Enoch was, you know, the story of my wife. You know, when my wife actually was, you know, um, growing up, you know, she had to live with a lot of people and all that. And um, it got to a stage that she started working. And the boss that she was working with, the daughter of the boss, comes to the office and just, you know, have a chat with her. And she will come, they will have a chat. She will come again, they will have a chat. And he, she began to got, get used to my wife. That anytime she's around, she wants to have a talk with her. Because she feels comfortable with her. She feels... Okay, she feels like she could express herself with my wife. And to the extent that it got to a time that my wife's boss had to call my wife, that, come, we noticed that you and my, my daughter, that, um, you know, you, you guys flow a lot. And uh, probably she's not the kind of person that flows with a lot of people like that. And uh, she said, ah, but, she may more or less make a demand that if you would love to live with us. If you would love to live with us. And you know, my wife said, yeah, why not? 
And before he knew it, my wife left wherever she was staying, and her boss more or less became her father. So, and that is a very typical example of what happened to Enoch. Enoch, you know, and then if you look at two, maybe two friends or two lovers, and um, you are gisting with each other, you got so used to each other, okay, let me see you off. Maybe your house is not too far away. <laughs> you walk the person down. You get to the person's house. You still continue gisting in front of their house. After gisting, ah, you, you need to start going, okay, let me see you off. And you'll see the person off again. We'll walk the person home again. They continue gisting. And before you know it, they just want to be with each other. And that was what was happening in the case of Enoch. That God got God, God so used to him that he said, come. Oh, this one that I come down to fellowship with you all the time, why not cook? just cook, cook, come? And come and be living with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and the Bible said, then he was no more. In fact, they, I, I want to believe that they don't, at that time, there was no revelation, maybe no pure revelation of the, of the rapture. That's why they couldn't talk about him being translated from this human body to the supernatural body. Hallelujah. So that was what happened to Enoch. He got so used to God that he totally became like God. That he totally transformed and became like God and he was no more. Hallelujah. So what are the kind of lessons that we can learn? By the way, maybe many of us don't know. Because of the work that Enoch worked with God, Enoch was the first man that saw the revelation of the rapture. Enoch was the first man that saw the revelation of the rapture. Hallelujah. We'll get there. Now, number one lesson from the life of Enoch is walking with God. Walking with God. And we can see that Enoch faithfully walked with God. Enoch faithfully walked with God. He faithfully walked with God. Micah 6 verse 8. Or before that. Now, walking with God means living in continuous, intimate fellowship with him. Living in continuous, intimate fellowship with him. And Enoch life exemplifies this deep relationship. Not just any relationship, but the deep relationship with God. Micah 6 verse 8. Micah 6 verse 8. The Bible says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to learn mercy and to walk humbly. To walk humbly with your God. The, the worst thing that can ever happen to a man is to get familiar with God. You get too familiar with God. You know, when, when, when there is this saying that says familiarity brings contempt. When you get too familiar with God, that is when you begin to think that the Bible is just a storybook. Hallelujah. And um, other examples of people that walked with God was Noah in Genesis 6 verse 9. And we know that Noah is more like the grandson of um, Enoch or great-grandson of Enoch. Hallelujah. So that's why, you know, and that's another thing that, um, that we should learn from Enoch. The fact that he had a uh, 
Hallelujah. He, he, he created this legacy of faith, of believing in God. And that was what, that was what Noah took. That was what Noah took. And that is why Noah had an unwavering faith in God. We can see example of people that took those kind of legacy from their maybe parent or grandparent. Another example in the scripture is Timothy. Timothy took that level of faith that he had in God from his mother and his grandmother. That's why he was unshaking. So if there's anything, the best legacy you can leave for your children is faith in God. Because if you have all the money in this whole world and buy all the things and buy, do all the investment you want to do for them. I've heard, I heard the man of God, the man of God, I'm not, I'm not the type that talk about the man of God. I, I respect the anointing of God. That, oh, I have done all the investment I want to do that my generation will never suffer. That I've invested, that I have done this, that my generation will never suffer again. And I asked myself that question. Didn't Abiola has that kind of money or investment? Where are the children today? Praise the Lord. So the best legacy you can leave for your children is not the legacy of maybe one investment good. Fantastic. Please, invest for your children. Invest for your family. Very, very good. And, but the Yoruba people used to say something that, uh, or something, something like that. Uh, uh, if you don't train your children, they are the, that house you are thinking, you think you built for your children. It's those children that will sell that house while you are even still alive. They will sell it. We have seen, have we not seen, where children sell property of their parents while their parents are still alive. Praise the Lord. So another lesson that we can learn, now, the truth, the truth is that um, I ask myself the question that how in this time and age, can we have exemplified that character of walking with God? Oh, we've heard it. Study the word of God. Do this. Do that. In this time, we want to make money. You have to pay mortgage, though. <laughs> Is it not? Eh? And you want to invest. You want to make some money so that you can... But how do you do all that? So my question is, every day of our life, just as we are taking time to do all these things, to invest, to make money, to do that, are you also taking time to dig into the word of God? Do you pay tithe of, your, of every day to God? Because God gave you time, is it not? Huh? Everything God gave us, we are supposed to give tithe of it. Praise the Lord. Do you give tithe of your time to God? You know, and then, um, you, know, you know, the Bible, sometimes I get scared when I'm in, in, uh, in a church like uh, Cornerstone. Do you know why I get scared? You know, when you are in a church that you hear the word, the truth, the word of God, you know that you will be judged more than somebody that doesn't hear the truth. You don't know. You will be judged more than someone that doesn't hear the truth. You don't lack the word. You don't lack the resources. And that's why Jesus couldn't look at that fig tree and just overlook it. Because it's located at a center where every resource is made available. So more is expected from me, from that tree. So and so you must live your life such that, ah, I'm getting the nourishment. 
how is it transforming my life? How is it transforming my life? Something you cherish, you spend time with. And the same thing goes to God. Hallelujah. Another thing that we can learn from Enoch is faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 5 that by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. By what? By faith. All that happened by it happened by faith. Praise the Lord. All that happened by faith. You know, I love what Martin Luther King said in one of his um, talk. He said, faith is the first step that you take even when you don't see the old staircase. He said, faith is the first step that you take even when you don't see the staircase. So you don't know where he's going. You just, you just take the step. Even marriage is by faith, too. Am I lying? You marry by faith. Because even if you think you know all about the person you marry, wait 10 years, 15 years down the line. Eh? You will see now. <laughs> Hallelujah. You marry by faith. So Enoch had an unwavering trust in God. And that was, so the question is, was Enoch seeing God face to face? Because the Bible says that you cannot see God and live. So all the time he was living, that he was walking with God, it's not like he was seeing God face to face. Everything he did as a result of faith, believe. Sometimes God speaks to us. And it looks as if, what is this? It looks as if, what is this? But because it is God that is saying it, you take what we, do, what we call a step of faith. Hallelujah. Abraham was another example of someone that exercised faith. And the Bible recorded that the faith he had was credited to him as righteousness. The faith of Abraham was credited to him as what? Righteousness. So it takes faith to be righteous. It takes faith to be what? Righteous. Hallelujah. So another lesson that we can learn from Enoch is pleasing God. Pleasing God. And um, Hebrew 11 verse 6 says, and without faith, Hebrew 11 verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So his life was marked by actions and faith that please God, showing that we can live in a way that honors God. Enoch showed us that we can live in a way that honors honors God. We can live in a way that pleased God to the extent that we will not see death. Very possible. Hallelujah. And the pleasers of God are not pleasers of men. Hello? When you are the one that wants to please God, be rest assured that most of the time you will not please men. Most of the time you will not please men. If your desire, I love, um, you know, when I was in Nigeria, one of our pastors then that, um, you know, he, he was being transferred to another district and he, he said, I, I, would I would never forget that. <laughs> I will never forget the statement he made. He said, well, he said, I want to first of all thank everybody. And I said, okay, for those that, uh, 
in one way or the other. I might have done things that you don't like. Well, I know the typical thing is for people to say, oh, sorry my, for my mistake or sorry for my, but in my own case, I will tell you that, well, I have done what God wanted me to do. <laughs> I have done what God wanted me to do. And uh, so if you are looking for me to say sorry, that means I'm not, if, if it's only when I've done something that is against God's will that I will say sorry. But in this case, I have done what God wanted me to do. And that's how our testimony should be. That we can say that we have done what God wants us to do. Hallelujah. So another thing that we can another lesson we can learn from Enoch is that God rewards the faithful. God rewards the faithful. God rewards the faithful. God rewards the faithful. You know, a very good example of someone who uh, worked faithfully with God was Moses. You know, Moses could have decided to stay in Egypt and enjoy all the... That's, that's why God couldn't overlook... The, the behavior of the Israelites when they said, ah, you left us, uh, you, we left all the cucumber and all the nourishment that we are eating in this thing, Egypt. You know, when God saw all those things and heard all those things, he got to a time, a journey that was supposed to take them 40 days, took them 40 years. Took them what? 40 years. That journey of it was God that did it all. If you've not read the scripture, go and read it. God told Moses, He said, Moses, see, don't take them through this path. Because they could get to the promised land and start misbehaving and go back to Egypt. Don't take them through this quick path. Take them through this long road. So that He can prune them. Sometimes the journey, sometimes things that are supposed to take us one year, God deliberately wants to take, wants it to take 10 years so that he can prune some things in our life. Because he knows that when you get to that place, you might mess it up. And so he wants to prune some things from your life. So it looks as if God is delaying your blessing. No, God is working on you. Reminds me of, um, you know, when God was teaching me about when God is silent. Yeah, those are some of the things that happen when God is silent. Because he's working on you. He's doing a work on you. Hallelujah. Another lesson that we can learn from the life of, from the life of um, Enoch is living a righteous life in a wicked world. Living a righteous life in a wicked world. It's so interesting that it is that same period when God was saying that he couldn't find anyone righteous on earth that there was now a man that was working with him. Maybe that's why God took him away, because of the, because of the wicked world. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we can see that in the grandchild of Enoch, Noah, we can see the same trait in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he also worked with God, just like Enoch worked with God. 
Just like Enoch walked with God. So Enoch lived a righteous life despite the wickedness around him, showing, it, showing that it is possible to remain godly in a godly, in a corrupt time. It is very, very possible to remain godly in a what? Corrupt time. Matthew 5, verse 16. Matthew 5, verse 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Then Philippians 2, verse 15. Philippians 2, verse 15 says, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He said, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Hallelujah. So, it's step by step. First, you become blameless and pure. You walk with God, that's the first step. Then you become blameless and pure. Hmm? Even among this warped and crooked generation. He said, when you are able to do that, they won't happen to you. He said, you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You know, when God wants to talk about shining, most of the time, he, well, when we want to talk about shining, we don't, use the, we don't use sun. We use stars. And scientists have actually shown that the smallest of stars shine brighter than the sun that we actually see. The smallest, the tiniest that is so difficult to see shine brighter than the sun that we actually see. Praise the Lord. So irrespective of how little that your light might be, because you are walking uprightly with God, you are going to shine. And that's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. So when we live a righteous life, in this world, just like Enoch did, we can shine bright. We can shine bright. And we can see examples of people that in the scripture that despite their crooked generation, despite the kind of people that are around them, they were able to shine. Daniel was a very good example. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were a very good example of people that shine even Amongst the Bible says, those that were selected were not just anybody, those that were the best of the best. So, even among the best of the best, they still shined. Joseph is another example. Despite being sold as a slave, he got to a place as a slave. He might have got into Canada as an immigrant, but that doesn't mean you cannot shine bright. Hallelujah. Esther is another example. Esther is another example. I love what C.S. Lewis put in, his, in one of his books. He said, the world does not need more Christian writers. He said, it needs more good writers and composers who are Christians. You know, it might look as if, ah, what does this mean? You know, C.S. Lewis is actually a very, <laughs> very, very powerful writer. He said, the world does not need more Christian writers, but it needs good writers and composers who are Christian. You know what, you know what it means to be a Christian writer? You know, <laughs> so when you are a Christian, when you are a Christian, your lifestyle 
alone speaks a lot. Your lifestyle alone does what? Speak a lot. There is difference between being a Christian writer or, or, and being a writer who is a Christian. There is difference between being a Christian singer and there being a singer who is a Christian. There are two different things. Praise the Lord. A Christian singer will, oh, I know how to compose gospel music. I'll just get the Bible and compose songs that are Christians, that praises God. That's a Christian singer. That's a Christian writer. Pick up the Bible and get some things from the scripture and use it to write a book. That's a Christian writer. But a writer that is a Christian or a singer that is a Christian, their life depicts Christ. Their life comes first as being a Christian before what they are producing. Many of us in the scripture, we, we look at the story of Cain and Abel and we talk about Cain, God accepting the offering of Abel, God not accepting the offering of Cain. Go and search that scripture very well. The Bible says, and God accepted Abel and his offering. The life of Abel was what became acceptable before his offering. And that's what we are asking for. Not Christian writers, but writers who are what? Christians. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. You know, when you have a Christian writer, it's easily for you to sway when you see that your write-up or your song is not making enough money. You just switch because you want to make money. If you are a Christian writer, but if you are a writer who is a Christian, it doesn't matter whether your, your this thing is making money. So that's why a particular um, gospel musician was talking in an interview. He said, Dunsio Yeko and uh, Pastor Nathan Ebasi, that wherever you call them to, they don't charge. And he said something like, ah, if God is not telling you that, don't do that too. He was saying this in a public. And they have gotten to a point in their life that they are not just singers, they are not just songwriters, but they are Christians who are writing songs, who are singing to praise God. Praise the Lord. So, legacy of faith. Legacy of faith is another thing that um, another um, thing that we need to learn from. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah. The, the part I actually wanted to show before we go to legacy of faith is prophesying, which... Uh, in, in Jude chapter 1, you know, Jude is only one chapter. Jude, Jude verse 14 to 15. The Bible talks about Enoch in that place. The Bible says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. It's so, it's so powerful to know that he was the seventh from Adam. S signifies perfection. Hallelujah. And, you know, God also rested on the seventh day. You know, seven is very, very powerful. The seventh from Adam prophesied about them. About what? See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all, the, all of them of all the ungodly as they have committed in the ungodliness and all of the different words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Now, this was the first prophecy of the rapture. And this was done this was prophesied by Enoch. Hallelujah. Why? Because he walked with God. He walked with God. He, he saw so many things. Now, I was privileged to be chatting with um, mommy, and then um, I came to realize about John, John the Beloved, 
And even in the case of, um, even in the case of Enoch, when I was actually t- studying and learning about him, that he's this kind of creative person that they are very restless. And those kind of people, they have unthinkable insights into the things of God. There are many of them like that in the scripture. Enoch is one of them. John the Beloved is one of them. That's why I could talk about Revelation. That every other disciple couldn't even, couldn't even see or couldn't talk about. Hallelujah. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So, I, I, if I have opportunity to be here again, I, I, would, I would definitely continue this. Um, because of time. Uh, because there are... There are some other ones that we are unable to touch. Uh, I hope that um, we can come back again and, and, and do that. Now, in conclusion, the life of Enoch, though briefly recorded, briefly recorded, provide, provides a profound blueprint for living a life of faith and righteousness. The life of Enoch Though briefly recorded, provi- provides a profound blueprint for living a life of faith and righteousness. By working closely with God, maintaining unwavering faith, and living a life that pleases Him, believers can find themselves commended by God just as Enoch was. I pray that God will transform our lives that until when we'll be with him in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord.